Tip number one is to set up a ready to go project layout and save it as the default set. So this way, every time you start Ableton, you'll have all of your most used instruments, the audio effects and the settings at your fingertips. So you can just start getting creative straight away, you know, without trying to start from a blank slate every single time. So for example, on my default sets, I have a synth stack that I love, a standard grand piano for laying down ideas quickly, and also a 707 kit with a really simple 4-4 loop. A nice clean bass sound just for jamming along, but I've also got an audio track with the right inputs, which is ready for dropping in samples, which leads nicely into number two. Tip two is to use Soundflower for sampling audio from your computer. So I really like to sample from old vinyl records, but I don't actually have a record player at the moment. So I found a way to get any audio that's happening on my Mac's computer uh, to come into an audio track into Ableton. So that allows for a really quick sampling process. So particularly if you use Spotify or Tidal or even YouTube to get sample ideas, uh, you can install Soundflower. So this acts as a virtual audio interface, which means you can route your computer's audio output to Soundflower's virtual input. So once you've installed Soundflower, you'll need to create a unique output option. So this is going to be a combination of your usual output device, which will typically be your audio interface and Soundflower as a combo. To do that, you head to the audio MIDI setup on the Mac, which lists all of your audio devices on the left here. You can create a new one here. So I'm going to call mine audio six plus SF. So I know exactly what that is. We now need to make sure that this is the output device selected in our system preferences. Back in Ableton, in the audio preferences, make sure that the audio input device is set to Soundflower. The setup we have now is that Ableton is getting audio from an external input, which is set to Soundflower. And because our audio output is a combination of the audio interface and Soundflower, it just means whatever my computer is outputting as audio comes into Ableton as well. So this is perfect for grabbing snippets of tracks from any streaming service or YouTube video or any media that you play on your Mac. Tip three, which is to make sure that your buffer size is suitable for your activity. So on new machines with faster multi-core processors and eight plus gigs of RAM, this won't be a huge issue, but it's still worth considering. So when recording instruments or audio into the computer, you'll of course want as little latency as possible. And so it's best to ensure that the buffer size is set correctly, depending on what you're doing. So when you're creating and recording, it's good to keep the buffer size as low as possible. Now for me, 128 works absolutely fine, uh, but it is nice to not have to keep flipping between these all the time though. So if you have a relatively powerful computer, keeping this on 256 for all but the most extreme of multi-track and plug-in laden projects uh, should be fine, but just experiment what works for you. Tip number four, if you do have tons and tons of tracks and it's getting really tough to navigate around the project, just zoom out. So head to the preferences and on the look field tab, we can zoom out the display all the way down to 50%. So loads and loads more tracks can be viewed in the main window, which is really, really handy for mixing um, and just getting a general better view of your project. And you can also zoom in as well, don't forget. And now one reason to zoom in a fair bit is actually when you use the Ableton sampler because its own view isn't expandable like some of the other plugins. So I like to see the waveforms in a lot more detail. So I'll zoom right up when I'm when I'm working onto that. And one thing to bear in mind though is if like me you use uh, the second window option, the zoom changes you make will affect both windows together. Uh, it would be nice to, to have the option for it to be independent. So if anyone knows a way to achieve that, um, other than having a different native monitor resolution, obviously on another monitor, then do, do let me know in the comments. Tip number five, something particularly useful for beginners are the built-in live lessons, which are really thorough guides on all aspects of the system. But once you click the X and get rid of it, uh, you might wonder how to access them again. So this one's easy. So if you just head to the help menu and click help view, uh, this restores those live 10 lessons. And for more advanced users, there's still a wealth of handy tutorials in here. And I particularly like uh, the Max for Live lessons. 
Tip number six, who else watching this has gone to load up an old project from weeks or months ago only to get that dreaded sample missing orange box of shambles down at the bottom of the screen? Absolutely kills me. So to prevent this, I always make sure to use the collect all and save option when saving your project. Can't recommend this highly enough. Using this option just ensures that all the samples and the data gets gathered up into each project so it doesn't have to try and access different sounds and files from different hard drives. Uh, it's not essential if you're super, super organized, but if you're like me, then you change your laptops or computers way too frequently. This should save some tears down the road. Tip seven. When I'm just knocking up a quick beat or just jamming along to a beat with some chords, it's nice to know that if I make some timing errors, which is inevitable, the record quantization is there to save time editing these issues afterwards. On the edit tab, click record quantization and I recommend choosing um, eighth or sixteenth note. Uh, so pretty much all of your discrepancies are caught and shifted automatically. Plus the loop brace will have a solid guess as to where to end when you stop recording, which can be really handy as well. Number eight is a very quick one, but I use this all the time. When you're in the MIDI editor and you want to move your notes up or down an octave, don't even think about dragging them by their individual notes. Uh, that can be tricky to do, and uh, it's much better just to use the keyboard shortcut, okay, which is just simply a case of shift and then pressing the arrow key up or down to move up and down octaves with each press. Tip nine, uh, having the snap to grid option enabled is very handy, of course, when you're placing notes for your solid timing, but quite often for a more human feel, particularly with drums or piano notes, it's good to place the notes slightly off grid. So if you click and drag whilst holding down the command key, uh, then this unlocks the, uh, the snap and you can smoothly shift the notes in and around the grid lines. And the final tip for today, number 10, is the sample transient envelope. Now, what the hell does that mean? Well, this can be really useful on either like full drum or percussion loops where the sound is a bit loose or there's a ton of reverb or excess noise. In the sample editor, switch the envelope type to forward only and start to reduce the amount. And you'll hear that it really starts to tighten up the sound because it's just reducing the tail of, uh, of each of these transient hits. And it's a really great option to help clean up your beat samples, but it can also work really well on single hits like kick drums too. If you found an awesome kick sample that you love, but the tail is a bit too long, then just give this technique a try. Let me know how you get on. Thank you very much for watching guys. There's 10 of my favorite Ableton tips and tricks, and I should be able to come up with at least another 10 for the next video. Uh, let me know if you find these helpful, if you want any other videos like this or, bit more specific, whatever you like. Let me know. Cheers.